It's very easy to fall into the trap of not regarding Theodosius II as being very important. He was, after all, a palace prince, he never led an army into battle, and he rarely ventured far from Constantinople. However, the man did reign for 42 years, and over the course of that 42-year period, the Eastern Empire changed quite a bit and became quite a bit closer to what we now think of as Byzantium. And this is also the period of time during which the West started to really decline and fall apart, and it was under the leadership of Theodosius II and his various ministers that the East more or less began to turn a blind eye to the West and focus more on their own internal issues. So let's look at Theodosius II and his long reign from 408 to 450 and talk about his role, for good or bad, in molding the Eastern Empire into Byzantium. In 408, Arcadius died at the young age of 31 and left his son Theodosius II in power at just age 7. So this meant that the government had to fall to a regency, and the regency was headed by none other than Anthemius, who was the Praetorian prefect who had served under Arcadius for eight years already. He would soldier on for another six years under Theodosius II. Now, Anthemius is generally regarded by most historians as being one of the greatest of the Praetorian prefects of the East, and one of the greatest civil servants in all of late Roman history. Among his achievements, he oversaw a new treaty with Persia. Um, he dealt with a grain shortage in 408, and after dealing with that immediate crisis, he then went on to improve the logistics of the Egyptian grain supply to make sure that something like that wouldn't happen in the future. He also helped war-ravaged war Illyria. Um, that area had been uh, hammered by the Visigoths under Alaric, and he gave imperial aid to help rebuild towns there. And in 414, his last year in office, he remitted all tax arrears, which dated back from 368 to 407. Um, and that was something that officials had to do once in a while, because after a certain amount of time, it would become impossible to um, catch up on taxes if you were decades behind. So, all in all, Anthemius left office with an excellent reputation, and he did a lot to um, set the government in good standing going forward. Arguably, none of the things I talked about above would be enough to put Anthemius in the first rank of historical figures from the 5th century. However, one thing that he did make sure that his reputation lives on and it also ensured that Theodosius II's name would be remembered, and that was the building of the Theodosian Walls. Anthemius is the guy who supervises construction and had the major oversight of the project, and this project would be completed in 413, the second to last year of Anthemius's tenure as Praetorian Prefect. Um, what the Theodosian Walls did is extend Constantinople's perimeter a great deal beyond what the Constantinian Walls had done in the 4th century, and these walls not only made Constantinople bigger and enabled it to grow more, but these walls were much more fortified and formidable than the older walls. Now, eventually these walls will come to be seen as inseparable from Constantinople's identity, and it will be these very walls which for the next thousand years will prove to be the greatest of all medieval fortifications. So... This is the main reason why people still remember Anthemius, and also the reason why later Byzantines would still know who Theodosius II was. In 414, Anthemius disappears from history. Most likely he died, and at that point, Polkyria, who was Theodosius II's older sister, assumed the role of regent. And she would hold that role for two years until 416, when Theodosius II would turn 15 and come into power in his own right. Um, Polkyria adopted Aurelian as her Praetorian prefect to replace Anthemius, and Aurelian is a veteran of the pro-Roman versus pro-German conflict, which had really racked the reign of Arcadius. If you want a reminder on that, I suggest you look up my video on Arcadius. Now, Polkyria is an interesting figure, and she will remain a key element in Theodosius' government for the entirety of his reign. Um, she's different from her siblings, her two sisters and her brother Theodosius, in that she has a dominant personality and she tries to assert herself in all matters. Now, one thing that all of the children of Arcadius had in common is that they're all very religious. 
So Polcuria, Arcadia, and Marina, the three sisters, all took vows of virginity, and in doing so, they were encouraged by the patriarch Atticus, who actually wrote an entire book praising virginity. Now, this decision would have repercussions way down the line when there were no heirs for Theodosius II, but at the time, this may have seemed like a good idea since it prevented the growth of cadet branches of the Theodosian dynasty. Um, now, when she took over as regent, Polcuria took Theodosius under her wing and really directed his education. And apparently, her, her main concern was making sure that he deported himself properly, so they spent a lot of time talking about manners and ceremony and things of that nature. One of the defining characteristics of Theodosius's court life is that because Polcuria and the other two sisters, Arcadia and Marina, were so religious and were lifelong virgins, the court tended to be very austere and it felt more like a convent than a traditional Roman imperial court. Now, if you remember back to the court of Arcadius, which was run by his wife Eudoxia, it was a place where there was song and dance and drinking and fun. But the court of Theodosius is basically the opposite of that. It is run like a monastery or a convent. Now, um, this means that this is one of the characteristics that will really distinguish the age of Theodosius from what comes before and after. And another interesting fact about this court is that most of the visitors are monks and bishops. They're not generals or officials or famous writers or anything like that. So, to put it bluntly, this was probably the most boring time to be a courtier in all of Roman or Byzantine history. Let's take a moment to talk about Theodosius' personality. Now, unlike his father Arcadius, it does seem like Theodosius had a personality that you can actually describe using words. He was charming, he was popular with the Senate and the people, so apparently when he would write about the city, people would wave at him, he could talk the talk, and uh, generally people were well disposed towards him and kind of liked him. He did share the religious zeal of his father and his siblings, however, although we don't know of anything like him taking a vow of virginity or anything like that, but his very tolerance of Polcuria's idea of what a court should be does heavily imply that he was just as religious or at least very close to as religious as his siblings and other immediate family. Now, Theodosius's main interest as a person were actually scholarly. He was actually a very learned man, but his interests were all in secular learning, not in things like theology. So his favorite subjects were classical authors, so he read a lot of Greek and Latin historians. He liked math, he liked natural science, astronomy, but his main interest, the thing that really got him up in the morning, was that he was really interested in illustrating and illuminating manuscripts. And by this point, we have manuscripts that are in codex form, and a codex is basically a book rather than in the old-fashioned scrolls. So um, because of that, and because of this interest, his sobriquet was Theodosius the Calligrapher. The most important thing that happened while Polcuria was holding the regency was a civil disturbance in Alexandria. Now, civil disturbances in Alexandria were pretty much par for the course. Alexandria was extremely riot-prone, and people would fight each other in the streets over things that seem pretty trivial and arcane to us. They would fight over matters of theology. Well, Cyril decided to provoke anti-pagan sentiment in the city, and the reason that he did this is simply because he wanted to elevate his seized prominence above Antioch and Constantinople. And he wanted to do that by making sure that Alexandria had a reputation for cracking down harder on paganism than the other two cities. So, um, that is part of a larger context, by the way, where um, Rome had already claimed the first spot in terms of preeminence among the churches, but the other slots were up for grabs. It was kind of assumed Constantinople would be number two because it's an imperial center, but Antioch and Alexandria have much deeper histories, and they also have produced way more theologians in the early 5th century. So, you know, if you're a bishop of Alexandria, you feel like this is a winnable fight. And for Cyril, he's this, he decides to take the low road. So what he does is he whips up Alexandria into another fervor, and this, by the way, also puts him in conflict with the civil governor of Egypt, who, as you might imagine, is not a big fan of huge riots, since that is his job to deal with all the 
chaos that Cyril is going to create. So Alexandria gets up into a hot fervor, and in the midst of that fervor, some really fired up Christian monks decide to go after a pagan philosopher named Hypatia. She's a famous philosopher and mathematician. Depending on the year of birth that you accept, she was either in her 40s or her 70s at the time. Anyway, she was famous for going around through the streets and explaining Plato and other philosophers to common people on the streets. Like I said, Alexandria is kind of a nerd camp. Anyway, um, her death is really something that became sort of a mark against um, the administration of Theodosius. And ultimately, it was something which helped to divide the court. Different people had different feelings about what had happened. But because the sort of bigoted brand of Christianity was current with people like Cyril and Pulcheria, it managed to stick and no one was ever punished for creating this um, condition where people could be murdered in the streets. If I may be excused for breaking chronology, let's go ahead and look at the anti-pagan activities conducted by Theodosius II and his administration more broadly since the subject has now been broached. In 423, Theodosius II confidently claimed that there were no pagans left in his territory. Now, we know that this claim is completely false because we have archaeology now, and we know that we can find pagan idols and other things all the way up until about the 8th century in rural parts of the Byzantine Empire. So, um, this claim is pretty false. So, we also know it's false, even without archaeology, because in 435, Theodosius II issues repeated prohibitions against sacrifices and orders existing temples to be converted into churches, which obviously implies that uh, there are still pagans out there doing their thing. Um, for the most part, though, 5th century persecution is not like the persecution that we see in the period of the Inquisition in the late Middle Ages. It's more or less limited to stopping people from practicing their religion, and it rarely ventures into um, attacking them for the way that they think or believe or even what they write. However, there was an exception made. In 448, Theodosius and maybe somebody at his court became aware of Porphyry's Against the Christians, which was an old text where Porphyry tried to discredit the validity of the Bible and of Christian doctrine. And he ordered that that book be burned. And while we don't know for sure, there's a good possibility that this burn order was extended to Celsus, who I think wrote before Porphyry, and then Julian the Apostate, the 4th century emperor, who wrote in the tradition of Celsus and Porphyry. And in the case of all three of these anti-Christian authors, we only have them preserved in Christian writings where someone will do large quotes of the earlier work and then write their own refutation or try to explain why the attempted refutation of Porphyry or Celsus or Julian is wrong. So, as I mentioned previously, Theodosius II officially took up the government in his own name when he turned 15 in 416. The first order that issued directly from Theodosius II that we know of is from 419 when he ordered his sister Pulcheria to go find him a wife and empress. So Pulcheria ended up finding an Athenian girl named Athenias. She was a beautiful learned daughter of an Athenian professor who had recently died and she came to court looking for a redress to her grievances but when Pulcheria met her she knew that this should be Theodosius's wife and so she introduced the two and Theodosius had to have her. But because she was the daughter of an Athenian professor and Athens was still a very pagan university town, um, Eudokia, as her name would become after she converted, uh, had to convert to Christianity and she had to have a sponsor, which was her future sister-in-law, Pulcheria. And uh, she ended up going through a course, she learned Christianity, and then she married Theodosius in 421. Um, Eudokia is, has one unique distinction about her above all else because we're going to talk about her quite a bit in this video. Um, she actually wrote Christian poetry and it, that survived. Um, and the reason that's important is because there are very few surviving female authors from antiquity. And she is one of them. And one interesting thing about her poetry is that it shows off her educational background from her pre-Christian days because she uses a lot of Homeric language language 
and she also employs lots of classical themes and imagery in her Christian poems. And within a few years, she'd given birth to a daughter or two, and that meant that her influence in the eyes of Theodosius was greater than that of Polkyria, and that would cause a lifelong feud between them. After all, Polkyria, in sponsoring Athenaeus, thought that she was creating a new empress who would more or less be subject to her strong personality. What she didn't bank on, however, is that the newly created Eudokia had a very strong personality of her own, and you know that someone is naturally going to tend to gravitate toward their own wife more than their sister. By 423, there were already two very powerful women in the form of the empresses Polkyria and Eudokia, but a third would arrive very shortly, and this was Gala Polkidia, who was the aunt of Theodosius II. She was born in 388. She had originally been married to King Atolf of the Visigoths, the successor to Alaric, the man who sacked Rome, and she had served as his wife for one year from 414 to 415. Then Atolf had died, and she had come to live at Honorius' court. Actually, the sequence of events is a little more complicated. She was at Rome for a while, then at Ravenna. Doesn't matter. Um, eventually, though, she went to Honorius' court and married Constantius III, who was a friend and colleague of Honorius. Um, however, Theodosius II had never been consulted about making Constantius an emperor, so he refused to recognize Constantius' legitimacy. And the issue became moot when Constantius died in 421. Now, around this time, Honorius began to develop inappropriate feelings for his sister Placidia, and he began to make moves on her. Well, you know, as one does, she did not quite feel comfortable with that, so she packed up and she brought her children to Theodosius' court. So now we have three different women who claim to be the Empress of Rome and only one Emperor. Despite the concern I expressed above about having three empresses in one place, the fact is that they didn't have to coexist for long, and for the short period that they did live together, it looks like they lived harmoniously, and that all of the children were also satisfied, that, because they had more playmates, and uh, things were pretty peaceful. But, that peace was broken on August 15th, 423, when Honorius died suddenly of dropsy at the age of 38. Now, the problem with Honorius dying like he did is that he had no clear heir. And because of that, this enabled a patrician named Castinus to elevate a bureaucrat named Joannes to the throne. Joannes is a pretty minor figure and someone who was literally chosen to be the puppet for Castinus. So Theodosius now has a dilemma, and it's the first major decision that he'll really have to make as emperor. Does he unite the whole empire under himself by conquering Joannes? And by whole empire, I mean, does he add coastal Italy to his holdings? Or does he simply install his young cousin Valentinian III, the son of Gala Placidia, as emperor of the West, and then let the West deal with his own problems? After all, if he does take over the West directly, then he has to deal with the issue of responding to uh, all of the various crises which continue to erupt on a daily basis. So, ultimately, what he decides is to put Valentinian III on the throne of the Western Empire. So, as I mentioned, Theodosius was at a crossroads, and he decided to install his cousin Valentinian III on the throne in the West. And, in order to make sure that he himself benefited from this action, he decided that Valentinian III and his daughter would get married when they both came of age. At this time, Valentinian was a child, and his daughter was also very underage. Um, and, just to sweeten the pot a little bit more, it was decided that Illyria would revert to Eastern control. It had been given to the West at some point, but now this was going to um, revert to Eastern control. So Theodosius was going to get something out of installing his cousin other than influence. So, um, he put together a large expedition under the command of Artaburius and his son Aspar. And after a considerable struggle with some radical changes of fortune, Artaburius was actually captured at one point, this expedition managed to overcome Joannes. Now, Theodosius, after this expedition had won, was eager to travel west and crown Valentinian in person, 
but while he was on the route, he actually fell sick at Thessalonica and was unable to complete his journey. So the Patriarch of Constantinople went instead. Um, now, because Valentinian III was underage, Placidia served as his regent from 425 until 437, when Valentinian III turned 18 and assumed control in his own name. The expedition against Joannes in of itself was not really that big of a deal. However, there were three young men present who distinguished themselves and would go on to play great roles in the affairs of both the eastern and western halves of the Roman Empire. Those three men are Aspar, Boniface, and Flavius Aetius. So, let's start with Aspar, who was one of the generals on the eastern expedition. He was the son of Commander Artaburius, and he commanded his own expeditionary sub-force. Well, when Artaburius was captured after his... Uh, fleet was hit by a storm, Aspar was the one who ended up winning the campaign, and he managed to even take Ravenna by navigating through the swamps and taking the city by surprise. Um, if you know anything about late Roman and early Byzantine history, you know that Ravenna was the most formidable point in Italy, and that taking it by siege or by surprise was extremely difficult. So that's a pretty big deal that Aspar was able to do that and it really established him as one of, if not the premier general of his age. Um, Artaburius was rewarded for this success with a consulship in 427, and then his son Aspar was rewarded in 434 with the consulship. As for Boniface, he was later very famous in Africa as a count, but he made his debut during this war as one of the key followers of Gala Placidia and someone who came out to support her. Flavius Aetius, who later became known as the guy who defeated Attila the Hun, um, was still very young at this time, and he had joined up with Joannes. And because he had been a hostage at the court of the Huns before this, um, he was sent to hire Hun mercenaries, and apparently he was able to hire a pretty large army. But by the time that Aetius and his Hun mercenaries returned to Italy, the war was over, so Aetius had to buy his position with Placidia by using the threat of these Huns uh, um, as sort of a bargaining chip. And ultimately she gave him a position and he was able to figure out a way to pay off these Huns and get them out of Roman territory. So that is how he eventually would go on to rise to high command. One of the signal accomplishments of Theodosius's long reign was the establishment of the University of Constantinople in 425. This university was designed to compete with schools in Alexandria and Athens in terms of prestige, and I imagine that the foundation of this university probably had something to do with that conflict that I mentioned earlier between the various sees of the empire competing for precedence. So it's probably related to that in some way, but the main purpose was to produce men for the church and the bureaucracy who had the necessary skills to understand the finer points of theology and to manage the empire. Um, this university would expand over time and there was actually a larger expansion a decade or two after its foundation. And if you look at the initial university, we see that there are actually more professors of Greek rhetoric than Latin rhetoric. And many of the old school historians, the guys who are really concerned about ethnicity and things like that, will point to this as sort of this time when the Eastern Empire starts to become more Greek and less Roman. Um, I think there's something to be said for that, but I think it's also very important to keep in mind that this process of the Eastern Empire taking on its Greek identity and um, starting to use more Greek in its daily life was a very long process, and we should also remember that they never quit calling themselves the Romans, and they never really quit being Roman. Another important project which took place under Theodosius and tightly coincided with the foundation of the University of Constantinople was the compilation of the Theodosian Code. It took about nine years between 429 and 438 to compile this new law code. Um, what it is is basically um, scholars of law took all of the various imperial edicts since the time of Constantine I and eliminated any redundant or contradictory laws. And eventually, when both emperors, Theodosius II and Valentinian III, were together for a wedding, we'll talk about the circumstances of that later on, um, they issued this jointly, 
and this became the new law code of the Roman Empire. Now, um, laws that are recorded in this code are important sources for conditions that obtained in the late Roman Empire. We can learn quite a bit about things like um, whether there were still pagans around, because we can see that emperors will continue to issue laws against them, and that implies that this is still an active thing. Um, and while the Just Justinian's Code is much better known and much better studied, however, the basis of Justinian's Code was this code by Theodosius, and basically the scholars under Justinian, like Trebonian, who would take up uh, that task, would more or less use this as a basis and then modernize it and expand it. One of the defining elements of Byzantine history is that Byzantium was always beset by intense theological disagreements. And yet another one of those cropped up in the middle of Theodosius' reign, and this is called the Nestorian Controversy. So what is it? Well, basically the Nestorian Controversy takes its name from the Patriarch of Constantinople named Nestorius, who was in office from 428 to 431. And his teaching, which roused such um, backlash, was that Christ had two distinct natures, one divine and one human. This led him into a conflict with Bishop Cyril of Alexandria. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Cyril was constantly engaged in trying to increase the supremacy of the See of Alexandria. And one way to do that was to take down the bishops of other sees, especially the bishop of Constantinople, who would be his primary opponent. So, uh, Cyril managed to get in a, in a what's it called, a synod held in 431, and at this synod, uh, Cyril and his highly orthodox followers were able to condemn Nestorius as a heretic before all of the other delegates could arrive. Nestorius, though, actually lived on for another 19 years and didn't die until 450, so his last 19 years he lived as a heretic who was out of favor with the administration. Um, now, Nestorianism itself, however, despite being condemned in 431, lived on for many centuries. It survived in Syria, and it was the dominant form of Christianity when the Arab conquest took place. In addition, it actually spread as far east as China. This drawing is actually from a Nestorian group in China. Um, I'm not sure exactly when Nestorianism died out in China, but it lasted for quite a while, well into the Middle Ages. In the mid-420s, Theodosius II had intervened in Italy and installed his cousin Valentinian III as emperor. And now, in late 437, he was finally going to reap the rewards for his actions. So, his cousin Valentinian III traveled to Constantinople to consummate his marriage with Lycania Eudoxia, Theodosius' daughter, and they were married at Constantinople. This is the probable occasion when the territory in Illyria that was part of the West was reapportioned to the Eastern Empire, and it added enough to Theodosius' realm that his Praetorian prefect of Illyricum had to shift his capital from Thessalonica to Sirmium, which was a great deal farther to the West and would be able to cover this new frontier. Um, while they were there together in Constantinople, the two emperors jointly issued the Theodosian Code, and this showed the unity of the East and the West. It's also worth noting that this is the last time that the East and the West will have a legal unity where each half is following the same exact laws, because after Valentinian returns to the West, emperors in the East and the West will continue to add their own edicts, and they're not always universally adopted by the other so law will begin to um, fragment and separate once again after this correction. So back when her daughter had been betrothed to Valentinian III, the Empress Eudokia said that she would do a pilgrimage of thanksgiving if that marriage occurred the way that it was supposed to. So after this marriage goes down in the fall of 437, Eudokia set out on a pilgrimage to the east destined for Jerusalem. Um, now, she gave a speech along the way at Antioch, which was a highly Christian city, which had a long history of being Christian, and this speech was greatly applauded, and the city absolutely loved her. She had impeccable Greek, like I said, she was a highly educated woman, and an excellent speaker and writer, and the city loved her eloquence so much that they actually built a statue to her. 
Um, when she visited Jerusalem, she toured all the holy sites, and she brought back some relics to Constantinople, one of which would be the centerpiece in one of the city's major churches. Um, and because of this pilgrimage, Eudokia would gain a lot of prestige um, for her piety. And because that was kind of Polkiria's bag, she was not happy about it, and it's from this time forward when the tension between Eudokia and Polkiria reaches levels that can't really be sustained, um, and this will ultimately destroy their relationship. And now for one of those instances when slander and gossip go down in the history books. So, let's start with the known facts. In 440, there was an official named Paulinus. He was a high-ranking official, and he was a lifelong friend of Theodosius II. For reasons unknown, he lost favor, and he was executed. Now, in at least one account, this execution took place because Theodosius suspected Paulinus of having an adulterous relationship with the Empress Eudokia. And the reason for that is for one of the more implausible stories in this period. So what happens is um, Theodosius saw a prized apple somewhere and he bought it because he wanted to give it to the Empress as a gift. And this was the, like the biggest apple he'd ever seen. And then the Empress had it and she decided to give it as a gift to Paulinus because she wanted to reward him for something. And then Paulinus needed to give a gift to Theodosius, so he re-gifted it to him. And then Theodosius recognized the apple, knew where it had to have come from, and assumed that there was an intimate relationship between the two of them, and on a whim had Paulinus executed. Or maybe there was an, an exile before the execution. But at any rate, that's what ended up happening. Um, however, there's really not a lot of reason to buy the story. This was probably something that was inserted in the history books by Polkiria, who survived all of the other actors, at least in terms of having influence in Constantinople. Um, and it also doesn't really make sense because in the account where this story is given off as fact, Eudokia left immediately to go to the, on her extended pilgrimage, but uh, in reality she actually didn't leave until 443. And she continued to deny this story even when she was on her deathbed in 460. We also don't know all that much about Paulinus, but it also seems like he was generally considered an honorable man. And it seems fairly unlikely that he would take such a big risk as to have an affair with one of his best friend's wives, especially if his best friend is the emperor. So anyway, um, this is just yet another great example of what happens when gossip gets recorded as history and how you can kind of uh, read between the lines if you look carefully enough. So, the larger story of the apple is that Eudokia and Polkiria were rivals now. They had probably been rivals for a while, but now things are getting to a breaking point. Um, and this is probably why Eudokia decides to abandon Constantinople and live the rest of her life in Jerusalem. Um, dealing with Polkiria is simply too much. So, um, it's probable for that reason, in my opinion at least, that Polkiria is the source of the Apple story, and she's the one that tried to tie the fall of Paulinus in 440 with Eudokia's departure in 443, and that she tried to imply guilt um, because of that. And if you look at the rivalry that they already had over piety, then it kind of makes sense that Polkiria would want, would want to paint Eudokia as an adulteress because then that makes her less pious than the lifelong virgin Polkiria. Anyway, there's, there's also another story which also seems a little weird and gossipy and petty, that there was a spat between the two over the prestige of their entourage, because Polkiria had a chamberlain. And when you know, Do Eudokia found out that Polkiria had a chamberlain, she wanted one for herself. After all, she is the empress who is the mother of uh, children and not just the emperor's sister who holds the title of empress but doesn't actually, you know, have sex with the emperor, to put it frankly. Um, but Theodosius, when she brought this complaint to him, said, no, you may not have a chamberlain that is a, an honor reserved for my sister. And that apparently incensed Eudokia enough that she was, you know, ready to call it quits. And she also, at this point, had no desire to see Theodosius any longer. Um, 
There also are reports that the eunuch Chrysapius is one of the people who is really driving this rivalry forward to advance himself. Because if one of these imperial women loses favor, or hopefully both of them lose favor, then at that point Theodosius has to turn to another source for advice, and that could be Chrysapius. However, blaming Chrysapius for this might not be accurate because as a eunuch he generally will tend to get blamed for everything anyway, um, regardless of whether it's actually his fault. And um, a lot of the speculation that it was his fault comes from the mere fact that he was the guy who rose up to be the next major advisor. But there's really no way to then prove that he was driving forward all of this court drama. Anyway, let's move on to other stuff. In 443, Eudokia left Constantinople and never returned. She would spend the last 17 years of her life from 443 until 460 in Jerusalem. Um, within several months of her arrival in Jerusalem, Theodosius sent one of his bodyguards, and then that bodyguard executed two prominent members of Eudokia's entourage. So there was some definite tension between Theodosius and his wife, but there's really no reason to think that it was because of Paulinus. It was more likely because of the spat with uh, Polkyria. Anyway, so... Um, at some point, for reasons unknown, Eudokia adopted monop uh, the monophysite belief, which is basically the idea that there's only one nature of God, and that is divine. And this was later labeled a heresy, and at some point, Eudokia conferred with the Pope Leo the Great, and she was returned to Orthodoxy. Remember, at this time, there was no distinction between the Catholic and Orthodox churches, so that is why it, it says what it says on your screen. Um, now, while she was in Jerusalem, she spent the majority of her time doing charitable work and making various improvements to the city of Jerusalem, so her stay in Jerusalem was not without results, and eventually, just like her rival Polkyria, she would go down as a saint in the Orthodox Church. The period from 443 to 450, the last phase of Theodosius' reign, is what I would call the control of Chrysaphius since Chrysaphius became the primary advisor to Theodosius for these years. Now, when Eudokia left, you might think that Polkyria would return to favor and be the emperor's primary advisor, but that's not how it worked out. For whatever reason, there was some tension between Polkyria and Theodosius. I assume it's because he held both of them responsible for um, the breakdown of their family, and he was bitter. Anyway, for whatever reason, Chrysaphius will now become the major advisor. And the major topic that Chrysaphius and Theodosius will have to deal with during these last seven years is the crisis caused by the rise of a newly emboldened Hunnic Empire under a charismatic leader, Attila. So let's look at the nature of the Hunnic threat to the Eastern Roman Empire. Before 430, Theodosius and his predecessors hadn't really had many major experiences of direct contact with the Huns. There hadn't been a lot of direct conflict. Sometimes the Ro uh, Romans would hire Huns as mercenaries or send embassies back and forth, but there hadn't really been any deep engagement. In 430, um, Theodosius II agreed to pay an annual subsidy of 350 pounds of gold to the Huns, and this was designed to keep them happy and keep them out of his territory. Um, in 441, uh, Theodosius had sent an eastern field army to Africa to try to stop the Vandals. They did not. Um, and during that time, Attila struck into the Balkans. And this led to an extended war for the next five or six years when Theodosius and his armies were fighting in vain against Attila. Actually, Theodosius' armies, Theodosius never left the capital. Um, and during the course of that time, Attila was able to besiege and sack several major cities in the Balkans. Um, it's worth noting that one thing that made the Huns different than the Goths is that the Huns were excellent at siege warfare. So they posed a much greater threat when they were actually uh, invading Roman territory. Um, at the end of that conflict, around 446 or 447 even, Theodosius agreed to pay 6,000 pounds of gold for violating the treaty. Apparently, um, at least according to Attila, the war was Theodosius's fault, and he had to agree to 2,100 pounds of gold as annual tribute, 
and also the cost for ransoming back the captured Roman soldiers was going to be expensive. When people think of Attila, they realize that he was a threat to both halves of the Roman Empire, but most people really focus on his campaign in Gaul. However, in 447 he launched what may have been his largest operation, and it was against the Eastern Empire. And this was divided into two or three different armies, one of which was able to penetrate as far south as the famous mountain pass at Thermopylae. Um, the other force under Attila himself defeated a Roman army, swept it aside, and then marched on the Constantinople itself and tried to lay siege. However, the Theodosian walls um, were proving their worth, finally. This is the first siege that these walls had endured, and they proved too much for Attila, even with his mastery of siege warfare, um, especially when they were manned by newly recruited Asarian troops. And we'll talk a lot about the Asarians when we talk about Leo I and Zeno. Um, and these new troops, along with the walls, were enough to force Attila to retreat from Constantinople and ultimately go back across the Danubian frontier. But not before he did tons and tons of damage to the Balkans. So as I mentioned earlier, my sort of uh, opinion on the court life of Theodosius is that he was really depressed by the falling out between his sister and his wife and that this sort of led him to become more um, withdrawn in general. So as I mentioned earlier he spent most of the 440s dealing with the threat of the Huns and he didn't really have either his sister or his wife nearby and that must have been very difficult for him on a personal level. Um, there are some accounts that he began to lose interest in the affairs of government and that he got to the point where he would just more or less sign state papers without really reading them and that he was kind of withdrawn and had given up. Early in 450 he fell off of his horse and he suffered a severe spinal injury which after several months would eventually kill him. Since this series is dedicated to the Byzantine Empire and not the West, I haven't focused much on what has been happening in the West except when it involves the Eastern Emperor or an army from the East. However, I think it's just worth noting right now what the situation looked like in 450 um, when Theodosius died. This is what had become of the West. You see that it is deeply divided and that the Empire is very much falling apart. So keep in mind that Theodosius during his long reign presided over considerable decay in the West. As I mentioned earlier, in early 450, Theodosius fell from his horse and suffered a severe spinal injury, which would eventually kill him. So over the next several months, um, he turns to his sister Pulcheria, his only surviving sibling. His other two sisters have died, and they manage to patch up their relationship. From the looks of it, it looks like Pulcheria, by this point, regained her influence and Chrysaphius took a back seat. So, with no sons and all of his other sisters being either dead or virgins or both, Polcuria was now the sort of vessel through which the Theodosian line would pass. So, the plan was for Polcuria to figure out a marriage arrangement where she could choose the next emperor by marrying someone but come up with some weird marriage arrangement where she wouldn't be forced to have sex with that person. And with or without Theodosius' prior consent, and it's not really clear how able he would have been to uh, select someone at this point, given his injuries, um, Polcaria selected Marcion to be her husband and therefore new emperor. And apparently there's a meeting between Theodosius II and Marcion where Theodosius says, so I understand that you've been selected to be the new emperor. And just the way that that's phrased in the passive voice kind of implies that uh, Polcaria, as the person who was carrying the Theodosian bloodline, got to choose anybody she wanted, and she chose Marcion. Anyway, uh, Theodosius was still bedridden, and he eventually died on July 28, 450, at the age of 49. 